Right, this is a story all about an Englishman who went to Australia, you could say, to seek his fortune. Um, and because of what he did, he left a lasting impression in Australian culture, despite all the difficulties that the country put in his, uh, in his way. Um, but he did trade on something which was that um, the Australians love to gamble on anything. The gentleman I'm talking about is George Adams. And George was a, an Englishman born in Hertfordshire, 1839. And he went to Australia with his family in 1855. And uh, he did all sorts of jobs start. He worked in the Queensland gold fields. Uh, he worked on sheep stations. Uh, and he worked as a Cobham company driver. That's a coach driver. And he eventually settled in a town called Goulburn, New South Wales, as a butcher and a stock dealer. But actually, he did something entirely different next. Um, he bought himself a pub at a place called Kiama, and that's also in New South Wales. Now, he must have done something right and made a good reputation for himself and his ability to run a pub, because in 1878, three of his friends bought for him the Tattersall Hotel in Sydney. And that was the beginning of the making of him. Uh, as part of running the hotel, he had to run sweepstakes on horse races for the Tattersalls Club that met in Tattersalls Hotel. And at the time there was an, um, a recession in Australia and there were a lot of fly-by-nights who ran lotteries and then ran away with the money. But George didn't want any of that. He wanted to make sure everybody knew he was an honest man and he had independent verification of everything he did as part of his lottery. Uh, but there were things which were working against him. But there's a little summary of the dates we're talking about. Right? We've got as far as Tattersall's Hotel uh, being bought for him by three friends. Um, they expanded the Tattersall's Club sweepstake uh, into a public sweepstake. But Mr. Adams was not just interested in doing those things. He also uh, was a business entrepreneur. He bought himself a Coke Works. He built a generating station. It's a good job he had something else because in 1891, the New South Wales government, pushed by the church and the rather Puritan approach of the government members of parliament, they banned lotteries and sweeps because they thought it was very bad for the people to be able to gamble. So they moved from New South Wales uh, in 1893 to Brisbane in Queensland. But unfortunately, Queensland uh, did the same thing to him in 1895. In 1896, he found himself a friendly state and moved to Hobart in Tasmania. I'll tell you a bit more about that in due course. But after the formation of the Commonwealth of Australia in 1901, federal government uh, was, if you like, just as Puritan as each of the state governments have been, and they put a postal ban on George Adams' lotteries. But he was actually ahead of them, and I'll explain more about that as well. And although George died in 1904, um, he had a 
will which left the business as a going concern without um, the need for him to be there. And he had trusted associates who helped him run it. Um, one of the ways he got round the postal ban was by using a lot of accommodation addresses. And the postal ban actually la lasted from 1902 to 1935. Um, though from about 1904 onwards, it was largely ignored, but not completely. Um, and I'm not really going to say anything very much after about 1935. In fact, not a great deal after about 1911 or 12. But let's go back to um, the early days when Tattersalls were in Sydney. Now, George obviously did well running Tattersalls Hotel because uh, he managed to repay all the money to his friends by trying to get it right. Um, uh, 1894, and he re repaid all his friends and bought the freehold of the hotel for 40,000 pounds. But he had other businesses as well. But the drawers themselves, uh, I, it's, I've just found, I was looking today, it's extremely difficult to find mail to Tattersall in the early period of Sydney. I have an item here, but this is interesting because it's got instructional markings on and show that the letter was sent. It probably had coin in it, so it was officially registered and it's got a hand stamp on it which shows threepence to pay. But on the back of the cover, um, it's one of two examples of which says postal communications and and see relating to lotteries are not prohibit are sorry are prohibited in New South Wales. And that's the earliest recorded date of that, and it's um, shortly after actually the state ban came in. But very rare item that. Now, they moved to Brisbane because the government didn't like them in New South Wales. And he had a colleague called David Harvey who supported him. And uh, here are a couple of examples of, again, officially registered letters because people seem to forget that if you sent coin, you had to register it. And the post office made a few bob out of uh, officially registering them and taking uh, threepence or six months at a time. And uh, there's actually an argument which has never been settled. If you look at the original regulation, it says that if you officially register something, you charge a single registration fee. But it seemed to be that as in was done for uh, postage due, you should double the underpayment but I've not ever found a regulation which actually backs that up. But uh, I, I've started a correspondence in various journals and uh, nobody really knows. Anyway, these are a couple of things which are used uh, to the office in Brisbane. Um, there are only about 40 covers known and uh, the lower one, as far as I know, is the latest recorded date though these things do turn up from time to time. However, he hadn't been there very long, just a couple of years. 1895, Queensland passed similar legislation and they were banned again. Now, Tasmania, an interesting little state um, because it had very little by way of natural resources. Um, it had farming, which helped it feed itself, but not a lot that they could export. And uh, they were very happy to have Adams bring his lottery organization to the, the state. 
But in order to prove it, <coughs> fortunately for him, uh, the Bank of Van Diemen's land had gone into liquidation. And George Adams ran a grand lottery raffling off their buildings. And here's an example which shows the first prize. And George Adams very successfully ran a lo lottery and raised a large sum of money to pay off the creditors. And that's just part of a special brochure which they published showing what all the prizes were that people could win. Now, as a result of his success in doing that, um, he uh, negotiated a license with the Tasmanian government to be the mm -hmm. only operator of lotteries and sweeps in Tasmania. Um, and again, his reputation, which he reinforced by running that lottery for the Van Diemen's Land Bank, was that he was a scrupulously honest and straight dealing man. And they were very happy to let him be the only operator. A couple of covers there from Queensland coming to Hobart. And this time somebody's actually remembered to register them. Uh, and they're paying the correct rate, five pence. Uh, and they're all addressed to Tattersall and no problem uh, with, uh, with the postage. Tattersall's uh, were well organised and they sent out um, an envelope with a, all the stuff that they sent out to the people. And these are some examples of the Tattersall envelopes, a mint one at the top or unused one, and uh, a couple of them which have been used and the middle one here one with the uh, Penny Tasmania Pictorial on it, you'll see it's got an A perfin. So it's probably been used on company business and has been used by some uh, member of the staff to send stuff into Tattersall's care of George Adams. And the one at the bottom here is sent in interstate and it's paying the tuppenny rate. Now, they wanted to help their clients as much as possible. And I'm sorry, uh, these I know, I'm not expecting you to read them, but all they're saying is these are just to show that they give hints concerning uh, for uh, intending subscribers, because people subscribe to Tattersall's consultations, nothing so common as a lottery. And uh, the one on the right is actually the reverse of that first one. And it says facts about Tattersall's monster consultations. And it really just gives a general description because they're documents to help the subscribers have a warm feeling about the person they were doing business with. Now, just to prove that it was trusted by people elsewhere, uh, there's a copy of a letter here from a gentleman in Broken Hill. And they asked George Adams, please will you run a sweep for us, as usual, on our Silver City Cup horse race. And it's just a tribute, again, to his honesty. And of course, that was they, they agreed to do it. And it's from the Tattersalls Club, a racing club, uh, which is a licensed Vittler's racing club uh, in Broken Hill. So there's plenty of demand for the services he was offering. Uh, some examples here of mail delivery within Tasmania prior to the ban. Um, the first one is registered um, and it's been sent to George Adams at Tassel's Hotel in Pitt Street, Sydney. Now, I'm not quite sure why that should go that way. It's probably on company business and sending some money because it's been registered. The other one is somebody sending in his money uh, to, uh, uh, and it's registered because he sent his money in to Mr. Adams to place his bets. And here's some examples of registered stationary envelope used from New South Wales, uh, which has been sending their money in. And again, no problem, properly registered, sent in. And this is just an ordinary envelope from 
uh, Tarago in New South Wales again and sending it to George Adams in Hobart and nothing to stop them at all. But uh, George Adams was well aware what might happen. Everybody knew that the Federation of the Australian States was coming along and when uh, it was uh, formed on the 1st of January 1901, the federal government took charge of all the postal services. They didn't waste any time and here's a, uh, the extract from the Post and Telegraph Act which says that um, basically lotteries are illegal and sending anything through the post about lotteries cannot be done. And the wording is very similar to the wording of the Act, which was uh, in 1895 in Queensland. However, because they knew what was going to come uh, in the late 1890s, Tattersalls had been working extremely hard on ways of avoiding a postal ban, because they knew one was coming. And I'll talk to you a little bit about how they did it in a moment. But they did enforce the postal ban, and it was a bit shattering in, in principle to the Tasmanian government because um, Tattersalls employed so many people and they brought in a huge amount of revenue um, through postage, employment, and in the 1900s, they actually produced about 25% of the GDP of the whole state of Tasmania. So it was actually in the state government's interest to make sure that Tattersalls wasn't closed down. Uh, however, they had to be shown to do what they should do. So they introduced uh, this hand stamp, uh, which says transmission and delivery prohibited. Uh, however, although they were paying lip service to it, actually it was delivered because there's a spike hole which says it did actually get to tassels one way or another. Um, you see this marking up to about 1904, the latest one is 1925, but uh, they are actually quite scarce. Um, there's a couple of examples used on overseas mail. Now these uh, came into Australia and were returned. Uh, and the first one was sent, went to the dead lotter office uh, in Dunedin and one on the right went to the dead lotter office in Bombay. You can see from the uh, stamp at the front. They even got charged for sending it back because there's postage due on it of three annas. Now, there were ways of bypassing the postal van, and uh, they'd made an awful lot of preparation to make sure that the business could continue as usual. And the basic things they did were, they used accommodation addresses, so they had a lot of friendly people who said, oh, we'll take in mail for you, and they'll send it on to you. Um, they had built up a very extensive network of local agents in all the states of the Commonwealth of Australia. And uh, it really was very extensive. Uh, people could use the telegraph system because although it was the Post and Telegraph Act, uh, the clauses only referred to the post so they could send telegraphs to Tattersalls. But Adams also built up a network of private parcel carriers um, they were very strong in all their publicity material, saying we have no connection whatsoever with George Adams or Tattersalls. However, um, they were actually a front for Adams, and uh, they went under the pseudonym, if you like, of uh, the Tasmania Tourist Association. 
and they were agents for the Tasmania Tourist Association. And finally, within Tasmania itself, you could send mail to Tattersalls as a railway parcel. So, the accommodation addresses. Uh, one of the ones which was used most by Tattersalls was the Commercial Bank of Tasmania. And uh, I'll show you a few examples, but as I say there, there is a little whole book about the number of accommodation addresses which were used, and there were 350 of them, uh, and they're all described in a book by my friend David McNamee. Um, you can tell Tassel material basically by the spike hole in it, but often there is a Tassel ticket attached. Uh, this one doesn't have, but um, there will be some other items which show it. But it's interesting because the commercial bank, the government had a real go at, Tass at Tassel just once. Um, after prolonged investigation, the postal authorities stopped 100,000 items of mail addressed to the Commercial Bank of Tasmania in October 1911, just before the running of the Melbourne Cup. Now, as you may or may not know, the Melbourne Cup is a major event in the Australian social calendar. It is the horse race of the year. It's a bit like the Grand National, except it's uh, on the flat. So if you like, it's like the Derby. And Melbourne Cup Day is like Derby Day. And there'll be a huge number of people betting on it. And they wanted to stop all this uh, happening. So they stopped 100,000 items of mail from being delivered. Um, but it was really only a temporary thing. Um, but they had to use other routes than the commercial bank. Uh, and what happened was that the bank had to guarantee they would no longer act as a conduit for mail to go to Tassels. And in a period of time, two postal officials were put in the commercial bank and they oversaw the opening of every item of incoming mail and every item that was addressed to Tattersalls rather than the bank itself had to be refused and returned by the dead letter office. And there is uh, an example uh, with a hand stamp on it. And to be quite honest, it's not one which I have in my collection and I've never seen another one. So things like that are howlingly rare. Uh, they used the stock exchange in Hobart. And this was actually quite good because um, it became uh, you could send a registered letter to the stock exchange and you could nominate somebody uh, to pick it up or you could authorize somebody to pick it up and you just uh, filled in this form uh, put your name on it and signed it and um, you just had to nominate a suitable person and any agent of uh, Tattersalls could come and pick it up for, and move it on and put it in the system and it uh, worked extremely well and this form here shows the sort of thing this is from somebody in South Australia who says I'll send letters to myself at the stock exchange and uh, you can pick it up for me a nice little way round um, a couple of covers here um, Elliot Grant, who was a deputy to the suite manager, David Harvey. Uh, and the other is uh, one of the Hadley family who owned the Orient Hotel, which is still there uh, in Hobart. It's been modernized somewhat, but um, uh, each one of those has got a Tattersall um, ticket stub on it, which was put on when the item arrived in the offices of Tattersalls. Sometimes they've been removed. Uh, sometimes uh, they, they, they <coughs> only have a bit left because people have tried to tear them off. But that was not the only way they did it. And uh, I've just got a couple of things I showed you there. 
Well, there's a whole load more ways that happen. Um, that's just a single page, handwritten, of the Tassel agents in New South Wales. Now, I don't expect you to read it. It's just to illustrate the point that that's just one page of many pages. And uh, they show the location of the person, the name of the person, and what the location was. And you'll see there are things like tobacconists, hairdressers, uh, licensees. They're all places where gentlemen or men were likely to congregate so that um, they could easily take bets off them and then send them to other colleagues in other states, usually a colleague in uh, Tasmania, where there was a sim similar list, and um, nobody was going to uh, intercept it at all. Uh, you could use the telegraph system. And uh, this is one from Wellington, New Zealand, received in Tasmania. And uh, it just tells Tattersalls that the remittance is posted. And it's been sent to Adams because there's no ban on telegraphs going to Adams at all. And it was sometimes used to give him messages and sometimes uh, they sent remittances to follow. Uh, just a use, useful way of communicating. Um, now this is a letter um, from uh, the four clients that forwarded mail for forwarding to Tassasols. And as you see, if, if you can read it there up at the top, it says, uh, we are in no way connected with George Adams of Tattersalls. We are bona fide carriers and we undertake to carry parcels anywhere. We have, however, in order to oblige you, made your enclosure up into a parcel and forward it to the address given. An enclosed booking receipt, threepence to pay, etc. And you'll see at the top here, it says, Agent for Tasmanian Tourist Association. And that's in Pitt Street, Sydney. So you could go in there and you could send your stuff and it was the equivalent of a postage system, slightly more expensive, but on the other hand, um, you knew it was going to get through. And the general manager here, D.H. Wilson, uh, didn't exist. It's, it's probably a front for D., uh, David H. Harvey, who was uh, the sweeps manager. Uh, these companies were advertised with little handbills like these. Um, and uh, you see again, it's got D.H. Wilson, general manager. Small parcels can be left with us. And you see that uh, you can use them or you can use Victorian Parcels Express Company or Main Nicholson Company. And I've got this one and I've seen similar ones for Sydney, Adelaide and Wellington, New Zealand. I haven't seen examples for Perth or Brisbane, but I'm sure they exist. Um, in Tasmania, you can send railway parcels. And there are two types, really. Um, there are two variants of Tasmanian government parcel labels. And if you, this is just stuck on the back of an envelope. And you see it's addressed to D.H. Harvey, Collins Street, Hobart. And that was, uh, Harvey was a big, uh, a most important manager in the management of Tattersalls. And um, Launceston itself had these pre-printed labels. The other ones, which are like this, green ones, uh, you wrote in the name by hand. And if you're being really keen, you can actually collect these from different places and a number of places had more had hand stamps showing the place name. Some of them have several varieties. Um, so another way to avoid it 
and you see they're addressed to Tussle Hobart quite blatantly. Another way to do it, um, in 1886, the Tasmanian Government Railways introduced parcel tickets. So these are actually much less common. Um, and if you'll allow me a little diversion, these tickets were done in penny, threepenny, and sixpenny denominations. Um, now, the penny one has an interesting story because uh, it was always used for returning milk churns on the railway. But the farmers complained because they found out although their milk churns had to pay a penny to be returned, brewers were allowed to return barrels for nothing. Mm -hmm. And uh, they eventually said, yeah, enough of this. And uh, they actually stopped using them. Uh, but the Tropony and Sixpody did go on with being used. And that example is, that's the front, the back of the envelope. That's the front, uh, George Adams, Tattersall's, Number six, Stock Exchange, Collins Street, Hobart. So another means to use to bypass the, uh, the, the ban. A little bit about the companies. Main Nicholas they accepted uh, the, the same company as Victoria Parcels Express. Uh, they accepted uh, unpaid and prepaid parcels. Uh, if you were unpaid, uh, a white label and paid labels were deep pink like this. And there's an example of the use of a, somebody's actually left their receipt uh, on the item. But that's the label which says you paid. And this is the so-called parcel, which is actually a letter to Adams in Hobart. Uh, and, the sale, and the sender forgot to take away his receipt. Uh, and there's one which is rather scarcer because it's unpaid. But if you look, and using a good philatelic term, this hand stamped uh, DHW for DH Wilson ties it to the letter underneath. So it's authorized by DH Wilson. So they were prepared to accept that unpaid one because it was on his authority. Now, uh, so that's how they avoided the ban on the mail. But of course, Tassels themselves had to send mail out and they were very big users of the mail system. And with that, they contributed a lot to the Tasmanian Exchequer. Um, so a little bit about the way they used it. They used bulk mailing, uh, and I'll show you the contents of a typical envelope that went out, um, how the ticket duty increased over time, a little bit about underpaid mails, and how they used stamps with perfins, and finally a little bit about some tassel underprints, because I know Tony's got some of those, um, so we'd like to see some more, I hope. Uh, bulk mail could be taken to the post office and they used um, a penny postage paid frankly so instead of paying the tuppenny interstate rate you paid a penny because it was bulk mail a couple of here going to New Zealand New Zealand was for a long time almost considered like an extra state of Australia um, and, and it took quite a while before postage rates to New Zealand diverged from Australian internal ones. Uh, uh, this one was delivered when it was rerouted. Uh, this one here, um, I actually, I think they may have misread it. Or what? But uh, if I'm think, if I'm right, this was uh, this actually pronounced Fangaroo because the W is effectively an F in the Maori language, and um, this was actually delivered, although it says undeliverable on it, because there's a backstamp for Fangaroo on the back. Uh, they changed those keyhole ones to two different styles of postage paid, and uh, there are actually very minor differences of where the uh, H, which is a timestamp, uh, 
appears under the word postage. So there are two hand stamps and both slight differences, but uh, that's the philatelist rather than the, if you like, social history interest of it. Um, a typical subscription envelope was like this. And what was in it? Well, there would be things like this, a couple of things for races that you could bet on. And uh, early on, I showed you Tattersall envelopes. Uh, there would be one of those to return things in it. And two consultation forms here. Um, and these are before things started to be taxed. So they're just straightforward five shillings. These would have been folded inside with the return envelope and they are relatively available on the market because a lot of these things really were genuinely undeliverable and unclaimed and they're on the philatelic market. Now, uh, from 1903, uh, they started levying a penny duty on each ticket. That's a penny per five shillings on each ticket. Uh, it started at a penny, was raised to tuppence, became fourpence, and finally sixpence on each ticket. Now there's a fairly late ticket from 1923, and you can see it's not five shillings, but five and sixpence. Um, cutouts here of the tuppenny and fourpenny tax, and there are lots of sixpenny ones because that's the one that lasted the longest time and uh, um, they're available. Um, but here is a five shilling ticket and you can see it's now not five shillings but five and a penny, one penny government stamp tax at the top right. And that's 1903 just after they've introduced the duty. And there's a 10 shilling ticket and you see that one is labelled Ten and tuppence, and um, this is again. You'll see uh, an arrival hand stamp here from DHW, and it's got a Tasmanian Parcels Express uh, ticket on it, which is, if you like, the equivalent of a stamp of how it was sent through the parcel system. Now, despite everybody's best efforts. Um, people still sent underpaid items. And the Tasmanian government made quite a bit out of postage due. Uh, I thought, well, you know, you've seen some officially registered items earlier, a uh, steady stream of underpaid mail as well. Um, now, I thought I'd choose somewhere slightly exotic. So here's a cover from Mandalay, which also emphasizes the wide spread of customers um, all over the British Empire, you find customers for Tattersalls. Um, this one was addressed incorrectly to Melbourne. It says try Hobart, and it's got a T3 at 15 cents, convert to threepence uh, to pay um, <coughs> Hobart. So that would be uh, more money uh, in the government coffers as well. And Tattersalls would have had to pay it. Um, there's no record here of payment because they would probably have had a lot every day and you only tax the top cover on the bundle. Uh, a couple more here, uh, domestically, and again, they've got a tassel label or a part label on them. And uh, this one, tuppence to pay, uh, and this one also tuppence to pay. Um, that one from Tasmania itself. Oh, sorry, go back one. Now, I'll, and the other one was from New South Wales. Now, Tattersalls uh, had no problem um, with outgoing mail, and they sent a lot using the bulk mailing system, but they used postage stamps, and to prevent pilfering, they perforated the stamps with the letter A. And there are five basic types, and there are uh, the details of them. Um, and they're interesting uh, because uh, they are, have some varieties if you're really 
uh, wishing to study them in detail. Uh, the various types. Uh, I hope you can vaguely see, I put black mounts behind so you can see the perpins in the stamps. Uh, one A which is tall, one B which is bigger and taller, and a regular perfin and an inverted perfin. Um, type two, you get it upright, sideways and inverted. And I think actually uh, upright and inverted is not unusual because they folded the sheet of stamps and they perfined them folded over. And it's sideways because the penny was printed vertically as was the Tupney Hapney. Um, type three is interesting because as you see, the holes really rather large and they didn't last terribly long because um, the uh, stamps became rather fragile with great big holes like that in them. And I'll show you an example in a minute. And type five, uh, again, an upright and inverted. And you'll say, well, yeah, you've got one, two, three, five. Where's four? Well, four comes next. Um, type four is interesting simply because it's one which got damaged. Um, and you can have, uh, you get it damaged and missing pins. Um, and the damage you here, see here is quite severe because uh, it doesn't really, it looks like a sort of slightly different P. Um, and uh, these are, I suppose, a mini collection in their own right. So basic um, damage with missing, uh, missing pins and damage with more missing pins. Some examples used on cover. Um, the first cover to Queensland and it's five day transit time to Queensland. The lower one, uh, it actually went, the person had gone away, they were not known, they couldn't find a forwarding address, so it got returned to Tattersall's about three months later. Uh, type two perfins on cover, uh, the in-state rate here and the interstate rate double here. Um, that's going to Northern Tasmania, this one to Broken Hill, uh, and the transit time was four days. Two days to Northern Tasmania, four days to New South Wales, because it would have gone um, across the Bass Strait and uh, would have been posted on in Australia. So it actually, the, the travel was quite quick because they did use the trains to move the mail around quickly. Uh, Adam's Perfins on cover, the Type 3, as you can see, there's been a bit of a mishap with this one. The stamp started falling apart. They're both probably internal correspondence, but uh, you can see why they didn't persist with that type of uh, uh, Perfin for too long. Both would have been delivered on the same day. Um, now, the top one here is interesting because uh, it's actually registered, seven penny rate, and it would have been the winnings from Tattersall's posted to a syndicate in the uh, Victor state of Victoria. Uh, it's a double weight letter plus registration. Um, I have that one and I have another one from uh, that syndicate. Uh, this one uh, has got a type uh, four perfid, but it's got two missing holes in the left leg and transit time to Carlton, Victoria is two days. And here you are, Tony, here are your Tattersall underprints. Now there are two types here, but um, there were an earlier type or two earlier types, which were hand stamped in violet uppercase letters on the back of stamps. And they were introduced about 1910. Now I've never seen those. These are the third type around 1910. And these are scarce, uh, but the others are obviously very scarce. Um, 
and uh, they come with er errors because here I've got a partial, a double, and an inverted, and they're all on King George V era stamps. So what happened next? Well, by 1935, the postal ban was withdrawn and they ceased to try and enforce it. In fact, for a long time, they hadn't really been enforcing it. But Tattersalls continued throughout World War II in Tasmania. And there's lots and lots of posts around coming from uh, servicemen overseas. Um, in 1954, the whole operation was moved to Melbourne. Great loss for Tasmania. But the historic archive was bought out by a Tasmanian dealer and he employed an army of young ladies to remove the stamps from the covers oh, yeah. um, and float them off. But fortunately, they worked backwards and they did stop around about 1919. And that's why there's quite a lot of Tattersall mail on the market. Um, I think I caught the tail end of it when I started collecting this stuff uh, in the late 1970s, early 1980s. Um, but uh, there's a huge amount of postal history has come out of it over time. But Tats is alive and well, and it is now part of Australian culture. Um, I've been there a number of times, and I've stayed in plenty of hotels where uh, they have a dedicated Tats Lotto room and they run a sweep every two minutes. So this is how George Adams, a humble man from England, went to Australia and he introduced something which is now part of Australian culture. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick. Brilliant.